అమ్మా అమ్మా నూకరాజ్ లేడు అమ్మా నూకరాజ్ లేడా ఏసీ లేదంటే బీసీ గారు వస్తారంట ఏసీ లాంచ్ చేయలేదు నేను కాదమ్మా నూకరాజ్ చేయాలి నేను ఎందుకు వస్తాను నూకరాజ్ లేడు రాలేదు అమ్మా ఎక్కడున్నా నేను గంట నుంచి ఇక్కడ ఉన్నాను ఎక్కడున్నాడు గంట నుంచి ఇక్కడ ఉన్నాను వీసీ గారు ప్రోగ్రామ్ ఎక్కడ ఉన్నాడో తెలియట్లేదు ఆల్రెడీ చెప్పాను అక్కడ ఫోన్ చేస్తా ఉన్నాను లేదు లేదు ఉన్నా మీ దగ్గర ఉందా వస్తుందా అనిపిస్తుంది వినిపిస్తుందా అదే ఆవిడతో మాట్లాడి వినిపించిందా ఓకే కాదు పర్లేదు కదా హలో 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 మైక్ టెస్టింగ్ వన్ టూ త్రీ మైక్ టెస్టింగ్ వన్ టూ త్రీ సరే హోస్ట్ గెస్ట్లు వచ్చింది కదా నాది హోస్ట్ అని వచ్చింది కదా సెట్ చేస్తాను సెట్ చేస్తాను నేనా హలో హలో వస్తుంది అన్న అన్న వాయిస్ బాగుస్తుంది అన్న అన్న నేను హోస్ట్ గెస్ట్ లో జాయిన్ అయ్యానన్న ఓకే ఓకే కదా వ్యూ మారుస్తారండి ఓకే కదా మైక్ టెస్టింగ్ 1 2 3 మైక్ ఓకే నాది ఎలా వస్తుంది అన్న అన్న చాలా బాగుస్తుంది అన్న అన్న ఒకసారి ఫోన్ కాల్ చేయరా నాకు ఒకసారి మ్యూట్ చేయండి ఓకే
హలో హలో మైక్ టెస్టింగ్ వన్ టూ త్రీ హలో మీదేమైనా మీదేమైనా ఉంది
मैडम गार विपस्ा ना वाइस अवतल वाइस विनम्मा मन की అవసరం లేదమ్మా నాకు ఫోన్ టెలిఫోన్ సరిపోతుంది ఆంధ్రాజీసర్మోహన్ రిజిస్టార్ గారు and then our own head of the department dr c v naid garu i extend you a warm welcome for this uh, prestigious international web series of lectures being held by at andhra university and organized at the department of meteorology and oceanography uh, as per a directive from the university administration 
uh, we conceived to hold a web series of lectures uh, uh, from internationally reputed scientists and professors all over the world so as to cater to the needs of the students who are there uh, confined to their homes in this pandemic situation of COVID-19. So it is a very good opportunity and then uh, using our own good connections and also the prestige of the university, uh, we requested all of the topmost uh, meteorologists in the world uh, whom they have agreed uh, um, as and when we requested and then I'm thankful to all those people, to all those 25 distinguished speakers who have agreed to give lectures to Andhra University. And I also thank all our dignitaries, uh, our esteemed vice chancellor, uh, rector, principal and registrar and our own head of the department for uh, giving us an opportunity to organize this uh, prestigious web series. And uh, you can find in the list, uh, many of them are uh, top rated uh, meteorologists, especially Professor Brian Hoskins from the University of Reading. He is an order of the commander of the order of the British Empire and he's a knight, Sir Brian Hoskins. And he's a Rossby Medal winner, which is equal to a Nobel Prize in meteorology. And then followed by Professor Peter Webster of Georgia Tech University, Atlanta. He's also a Rossby Medal winner. And then we have Shigio Yodin from Kyoto University, a very uh, mm, reputed dynamical meteorologist of stratosphere and troposphere. We have Professor V. Brahmananda Rogaru from CPTEC Brazil. And we have one of the pioneers of uh, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, Professor Ramaswamy, who is the first Indian to become a director of uh, USA Laboratory of GFDL. And then uh, we have many a plethora of uh, foreign professors. And we have our own honorary professors, uh, Bhaskar Rao Garu, Ara Rao Garu. And then uh, we have former director of uh, Inquai Shenoy. And then we got Brian Mapes, Fred Kusharsky, Professor Takimi, and Professor Adrian Tompkins from ICDP Italy. And we have all the laboratory sets like uh, uh, the NCAR uh, the Atlantic, Antarctica Ocean Research Center head, Professor Ravichandran, and Krishnan. And then we have Vijay Talabragada, who, are our, who is our proud alumnus, who is a graduate of Andhra University and is heading a very big laboratory at the NCEP USA. And I have my own classmate, Kiran Alapati, who is the head of the Environmental Protection Agency in the USA. And we have all the uh, heads of uh, national laboratories for this web series. And I now, with this, uh, I now hand over the mic to our head of the department to, uh, to give a glimpse of the department and followed by the esteemed vice chancellor's speech on this occasion. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Dear all dignitaries, a warm welcome to all to this inaugural session of International Web Series. I'm very happy to say that our Department of Meteorology and Oceanography an international web series on frontiers of meteorology and oceanography by inviting internationally reputed scientific experts to deliver lectures during December and January for the benefit of teaching staff, research scholars, and students. Our offered teaching and research programs in meteorology and oceanography in 1940. It, the department is the first in Asia and fourth in the world to offer these programs. And we are offering meteorology, MSc Physical Oceanography, MTech Atmosphere Science, and MTech Ocean Science, along with PhD programs. Our department contributed uh, trained meteorologists and oceanographers for various organizations and academic institutions at national and international level. But carried out various research projects involving studies on tropical cyclones, monsoon climate change, air pollution, physics of oceans and coastal processes. Our department has parted with the closest program and three times with the FIST DST program. Our department successfully completed many projects funded by UGC, CSI, DST, MOES, and ICCAR. The first is in December 2020 and January 2021. There will be lectures per The second series will be in February and March 2020. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I request our esteemed Vice Chancellor to give his message on this occasion. It's a good afternoon. Is my voice audible there? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, ladies and gentlemen, 
Good afternoon uh, to all of you. And uh, I'm very happy that the Department of uh, Meteorology and Oceanography is organizing an international uh, web series of uh, lectures on the frontiers of meteorology and oceanography. So this department, uh, in fact, is uh, the first in Asia and uh, uh, fourth in the world to offer a teaching and research program in meteorology. Since its formation uh, sometime okay, uh, during 1948, in fact, it has produced uh, many eminent scientists and professors uh, working uh, in and out of India. And uh, the department has uh, completed almost uh, 70, 72 years of its uh, fruitful service to the nation. And uh, the department, in fact, is known for its research in uh, tropical cyclones, monsoons, and uh, climate change, along with uh, oceanographic research and uh, coastal uh, processes. The department has been awarded, in fact, a COSIS program in uh, MTech Atmospheric Sciences from 1989, and which is successfully okay, ran okay, till now. And uh, the department, in fact, it, uh, it was also sanctioned the KIST program almost twice, and has successfully ran many projects from UGC, DST, Inquiries, uh, and the high care and many other funding agencies. Currently, it is uh, headed by uh, Dr. C.B. Naidu, and uh, under his headship, the current uh, web series is being okay, organized. And let me congratulate the head as well as all the faculty members, uh, Professor Ram, a very distinguished professor today. And uh, I hope that uh, the lectures will be delivered by a very eminent uh, academicians and researchers of uh, international reputation. Uh, just now, in fact, you know, from the talk of uh, Professor Ramakrishna, I understand that uh, uh, popular uh, scientists and professors from okay, very reputed institutions, okay, so, Sir uh, uh, Brain Hoskins from the University of Reading, okay, in fact, the winner of the prestigious Paul uh, Giuseppe Rosby Medal and uh, Professor Peter Webster, another uh, Rosby Medal winner from Georgia Tech University. And uh, Professor Yoden from uh, Toyota University, and Dr. V. Ramaswamy, the first Indian director uh, uh, for the so called, you know, famous geophysical fluid dynamics lab at Princeton, USA, are some of okay, the distinguished speakers. And I'm sure that uh, uh, maybe the scholars of the department and all the people who are connected to this particular web series would enrich their skills in the subject because this is one of the okay, most important departments on the campus. And uh, definitely the lectures okay, will yield right result. I would also put a request to the head of the department to record all these series, yes. because right now uh, the campus, you know, in fact, is not really open because of this pandemic. Maybe once the campus is totally open for the students, we can once again you know, replay all the lectures to the student community, because end of the day, the students are supposed to listen to our lectures and uh, get acquainted with all the latest trends that are happening in the field. So let me once again congratulate, okay, the head of the department as well as Ramakrishna and uh, uh, all the other uh, um, members of the department, uh, Samatha, okay, and all the youngsters who are there in the department, apart from okay, the scholars and, you know, assistant professors who are there on contract basis uh, for taking up this initiative and, okay, and organizing this web series. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, esteemed Vice Chancellor. And now I request uh, Professor Samata Madam to give her message on this occasion. Honorable Vice Chancellor of Andhra University, Professor P.V.G. D. Prasad Ridgaru, Principal, AU College of Science and Technology, Professor K. Srinivas Rao Garu, Registrar, Andhra University, Professor V. Krishna Mohan Garu, Convenors, uh, C.V. Naidu, HOD of the Department, and uh, Professor SSVS. Ramakrishna Garu, Chairman Board of Studies, distinguished speakers, good afternoon everyone and a warm welcome to all of you. I feel proud to be a part of this uh, inaugural session, which involves many eminent uh, academicians from all over the world. So I am very happy that uh, the Department of Materiology and Oceanography is organizing 
this international web series of lectures on the frontiers of material department which has a rich heritage of 72 years the first in asia and fourth in the world to offer teach and research programs in metallurgy and ethnography since its formation it has produced many eminent scientists and professors king in and out of india department under the headship of uh, dr tv maidu is organizing the present series of web lectures from december 2022 march 2021 cater the cater to the need of the student and uh, research community the lectures will be delivered by eminent academicians and uh, researchers of international reputation so i appreciate the first take by the department conduct these lectures over a long span of time. i wish them all the best in their endeavors thank you one and all thank you thank you very much madam thank you thank you very much for your inspiring speech कृष्ण I earnestly request you to address uh, this in order. Uh, it's my proud privilege to welcome all of you, and very glad to take note today's inaugural session, the international web series, which we are going to conduct. and i am so glad that department of met and oceanography as i understand from the progress from time to time it has made definitely on andhra babu university the department of met is a happening department in a happening university and so long in india many programs of training offered by the department of plant स्टूडेंट्स टीचर्स एंड रिसर्चर्स ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ मेट्रोलॉजी एंड ओशनोग्राफी Yeah. Uh, as I have taken note, the topic new perspective is a the speaker, Professor Brian Hawkins, from the University of Sydney, is a a great not to be written, not definitely by yeah. हेलो 
program the topic is most contemporary as i understand the speaker as i have gone through the profile of today's speaker professor brian hoskins from university of reading uk that he is a, a good researcher he has contributed in his own field known throughout the world therefore the department of metrology and oceanography of andhra university that has so much of its uh, progress in the campus as a happening department contributing to the growth and development of the country as a whole in the field of the metrology and oceanography requirements one can understand the seriousness with which in spite of severe bottlenecks how you are all there to overcome the pandemic situation in the current scenario and if there is determination and the will power that nothing can prevent us from learning perspective it is only not learning within the country and knowledge has no boundaries therefore when a knowledge of the current trends and happenings in the field of metrology and oceanography need to be shared with the experts all over the world so that the other part of the world comes to know what we are doing here is also in coherence with what is happening elsewhere the scientists all over the world together can bring breakthroughs in the field of metrology and oceanography so i believe strongly along with all of you on behalf of the organizers that this talk is going to give wonderful insights which will go a long way in building careers of teachers students and the researchers i take the opportunity and thank profusely the organizers of the the web talk and, and i thank the speaker who has come forward to share his thoughts on the subject and i also believe that this is how we are going to sensitize the youngsters the researchers and the teachers and this talk is going to provide required motivation in taking the research to the further heights and thereby resolving the issues that are there which are unsolved which are complex which are phenomena to be addressed by these experts under their guidance within the framework that today's talk is as valuable inputs to the researchers i once again congratulate all of you for having given me the opportunity to with a very productive learning useful learning and and happy learning and i take note that nothing can prevent us if we are committed dedicated for the cause of learning and learning is going to build a long way both economic and social development as i understand in that direction the department of metrology and oceanography keeping in view the university mission university purpose university act in the right direction i believe you are all moving and my whole hearted congratulations to all of you thank you one and all good luck to all of you 
नमस्ते ओवर टू प्रोफेसर रामकृष्ण ओके thank you very much sir for participating and then giving your valuable message now uh, i request our head of the department to propose a vote of thanks sir uh, yeah, i think he is not able to connect and shrinivas rao gar yeah principal he is not there mir thanks cheppan cheppan gar imgur ki cheppan cheppan gar rajiv gar rajiv gar kuda pc gar ki rector gar ki thanks cheppan I thank all the dignitaries for participating in the inaugural session of the web series on frontiers of mid-sea and oceanography. I thank our esteemed Vice Chancellor Professor P. V. G. D. Prasad Reddy Garu for sparing his valuable time and for his encouragement in conducting the web series. I thank our Rector <laughs> Professor K. Samata Madam Garu. For kindly accepting our invitation and joining us. Principal, sir, log in here. Join us. Join us. Meet you. Meet you. For joining us. I am also thankful to our principal, Professor K. Srinivas Raghavan, for giving us direction to conduct the web series. I am thankful to our dynamic registrar, <coughs> Professor Vatta the Krishna Mohan Garu, for his gracious presence and encouragement principal, in every aspect. thank you thank you sir principal sir will join now sir student here please give me sir photo ever na here student no sir ever no sir
సార్ ఇగోండి సార్ ఇలా చూస్తే ఎందుకంటే ఇప్పుడు మీరు వెళ్ళి అక్కడ లాగిన్
नमस्कार हेलो योर वॉइस इज ऑडिबल yeah um, good afternoon friends and it's a pleasure for me that uh, the department of meteorology and oceanography is organizing the web series and that i'm very happy and uh, to interact with this uh, program and i congratulate the organizers for organizing this uh, web series i am very happy that very very learned personalities in meteorology and oceanography are participating and delivering the lectures in this web series and transferring their knowledge and uh, the department of meteorology oceanography is a very well known department and in the meteorology they are doing really a great job particularly the andhra university proud of that uh, all the faculty members especially the ramakrishna tv night sunita and other for their excellent job they are doing in this and i wish the organizers that the program should be a great success and i hope the young research scholars and faculty will get benefited by the expert lectures by the very very eminent personalities all over the globe and i feel it is a proud that the department is organizing such a wonderful and magnificent program i thank the organizers for this in the college of science and technology i wish all the best for the coming days the web series must be a great success thank you thank you all thank you very much sir thank, thank you very much sir thank you sir sir by your direction we have conducting this uh, seminar sir you have given uh, encouragement to us sir that's why you have uh, conducted this web series thank you very much sir well, you are uh, constantly encouraging us for the development of meteorology and oceanography sir thank you very much sir namaste namaskar thank you aunty
Good morning, uh, Professor Sir Brian Hoskins. Good morning. How are you? Fine, sir. Fine, sir. Am, am I audible to you? I uh, we're fine over here. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm not going going on lots of walks, but not visiting many places these days. But lots of walking. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So yeah. um, yes. So can you see me? All right. Yes, sir. Yeah, we are able to see you. Perfect. Perfect. Good. 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 Thank, thank you very much uh, for accepting our request. And uh, it's an honor to for us to be on the uh, list of distinguished speakers. And uh, it's a good beginning for our web series. And I'm very elated to have you on our uh, speakers list. And then I'm very, very thankful to you. Yeah, it's a great That's opportunity. A great pleasure. No, it's yeah. a pleasure. Uh, and it's much easier to do these days. You, um, you don't have to get on an aeroplane. You can do it yeah. from your own home. And that uh, I think you've uh, you've done very well to take advantage of the fact that so yes. many of us are uh, are homebound, and so uh, we're very happy to take part in these sort of links. Yeah, oh, yeah, precisely, precisely, yeah, yeah. So I I hope you'll be able to see my slides when we start that as well. Uh, yeah, yes. And uh, sitting along with me is uh, Dr. C. V. Naidu our head of the department of uh, meteorology and oceanography. Good morning, yeah. sir. Yeah. Good afternoon to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, your department does a lot of teaching, does it, from yes, I look yes. at the website? Yes, yes. Uh, pa, yeah, much of the bulk of our time goes for teaching. Yeah. Yes. And you have many students? <laughs> yes, yes, about 90 of them. About 90, okay. And yeah. those are all levels, PhD students, master's yeah. students? Uh, uh, we offer courses in meteorology and oceanography, master's level. And also yeah. we have a, an MTech program in atmospheric science and ocean sciences, as well yeah. as a PhD program. Yeah. yeah. It's a very age old department in India. Yeah. 1948. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I saw your university is 1948, is that right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was led uh, initially by Professor R. Ramanatham, uh, who did his PhD at the Imperial College along with uh, Professor B. J. Mason. And then okay. Uh, yeah. I didn't know that connection. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I knew, I knew John Mason very well. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, it makes me feel very old. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and. Uh, and um, I hope the level of the material I'm going to give you is all right. Um, I'll try and take it reasonably slowly. And okay. I hope that if it's too much at some point, then people will just wait for the next slide and try and understand what they can anyway. I won't, okay. I'll try not to make it too complicated. Yeah, sure, sir. Sure, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, uh, let me take the opportunity. Uh, uh, I welcome you all, those who have joined this web link, uh, to listen to the prestigious lecture of Professor Sir Brian Hoskins. And uh, before I introduce you, uh, uh, the speaker, uh, let me make a note that uh, at the end of the talk, uh, you have a chat box. If anybody would like to ask a question, and uh, you can put uh, that uh, question in the chat box so that the speaker has had an opportunity to answer to your queries at the end of the talk. And, yeah. And uh, wait for two minutes. Yes. Just uh, I'll <coughs> wait for a minute uh, before. Uh, uh, sure. Yes. I yeah. joined you early to make sure it worked. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. 
doing that either to in time like that yeah Yeah, good afternoon all of you and uh, good morning to those uh, from the European continent. Uh, I'm much privileged and feel proud to introduce uh, Professor Sir Brian Hoskins of the University of Reading. Uh, Sir Brian Hoskins is a first class honors in BA Mathematics in 1966 and he earned his PhD in Mathematics Department in 1970. From 1981 till date, he has been serving in the Department of Meteorology as a professor, and he chaired the department during the period 1990 to 96. He was a president of the Royal Met Society from 1998 to 2000, and is instrumental in establishing the Grantham Institute for Climate Change at the Imperial College, London. He is a recipient of many awards. Notable of them are the Louis Fry Richardson's Prize in 1972, the Cree Medal and Prize of the Institute of Physics in 1987, the famous Carl Gustav Rosby Research Medal in 1988 from the American Meteorological Society, and he was a fellow of the Royal Met Society since 1988. He is a Willem Bjorkins Medalist in 1997, and he is a commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire in 1998. He has been elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 2002. He won the Simons Gold Medal in 2006 of the Royal Meteorological Society, and he has been knighted in 2007, and uh, he was a Bjorkins Lecturer in the American Geophysical Union in 2014. He is widely known for his work on the mathematical theory of fronts, extratropical cyclones, baroclinic instability, and uh, storm tracks. And uh, to read his biodata, it would take me a long time. He has got many, many uh, research papers to his credit, and with this, uh, I earnestly request uh, Dr. Brian Hoskins to start his talk. May I now request uh, Sir Brian Hoskins to start his lecture, sir? Thank you very much indeed for the introduction, and it's it's a great pleasure to be with you today. Um, and to to do it remotely is is not as good as actually being with you, but um, I'll try and make it as good as I can. Um, so um, I think it's you've done a very uh, very good job of organizing this webinar series and uh, I looked at the range of speakers you have and in fact I even had email contact with Peter Webster about what we're both going to present to you so um, and um, so well done and uh, I hope you all enjoy the talk and that you uh, you enjoy the whole series so let me try and um, present my talk now and um, so do you have to do something to help me get my slides up or will that happen? Can you see that? Uh, no, not yet, not yet. Uh, maybe you have to load your uh, slide. Uh, ah. so, yeah. You have to share your slide. Sir, uh, rear, near the mute button, there is a screen share option, right? Open, share, tray. Video. Share. Yeah, OK. Yes. Now, Okay, uh, I hope that, um, and... Uh, sir, init sir, initially you need to open the presentation, sir. Yeah, is this, can you see it now? Ah, yes. Ah, yes, sir, yes, sir, yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, good. Right. Okay, right, we'll... we'll Excellent, I'm perfect. glad you can see that. And um, so, it, um, you can see it's a talk for you, and it's... Um, some work we've been doing in recent years where we're trying to take a new look at what is a very old concept, the concept of a Hadley cell. And um, so I'll try and take this slowly to uh, make, <clears throat> make sure that everyone is familiar with exactly what I'm talking about. So I think we're all familiar with the picture of the atmosphere when you take a zonal average so you average along a line of latitude and you look at the circulation in the latitudinal vertical plane. And what I'm showing is the uh, this mean meridian of circulation for June to August, the northern hemisphere summer. And the North Pole here is on the right and the South Pole on the left. And I hope you can see my cursor as well. So this is the equator and we have the rising motion just in the summer hemisphere, and we have 
motion towards the winter hemisphere uh, just at, at, at tropopause level, just under the tropopause, and then we get descent in the winter hemisphere and then motion back towards the summer hemisphere. So this is what we, we know as the, the Hadley cell. And this has a long history of actually understanding this. But before I get to that, I want to introduce one concept, which is the conservation of angular momentum. And if we, uh, oh, excuse me, that phone will, uh, will uh, Um, if you just bear with me, that phone will stop any moment. Anyway. Thank you. 
Can, hello, can you hear me now? I'm sorry about that. I have problems with my internet. I, I hope it will work again now. I do apologize. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I'm sorry about that. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. We are able to hear you. Yeah, you can continue. Okay. Uh, I'll continue on where I was then. Okay. Yeah. So you can hear me now, can you? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Right, so 
I was just talking about a ring of air at the equator. Um, if we go back, we can think of a ring of air here. And we've, if we move that from the equator to 30 degrees of latitude. Yeah, Dr. Then, Hos yeah, Dr. Hoskins, can you upload your slide? Yeah. Oh, you can't see the slides again, can you? Okay, yeah, yeah. right. I'll, um, Can you see them now? Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Okay, yes. good. Right. Now we'll try again. Right. Um, so let me uh, get the slides up then. Um, right. Um, right. Okay, you can see that? Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. Right, so let's try again. Um, so if we move air from here to here, a, a ring of air, then because the Earth is very rapidly rotating, then conservation of angular momentum means that relative to the Earth, if it's stationary here, moving around with the Earth, when it gets to here, it's spinning faster because of angular momentum conservation. And it means that air would be moving around at a speed of 130 meters per second which is some three times larger than the actual flows round. So that's something we'll need to bear in mind. When we look back in history, then the Hadley cells are named after George Hadley. And he was around in, he wrote a paper in 1735, very long time ago, in which he showed these Hadley cells and they're named after him. But he showed them going almost as far as the equator. What he was trying to do was explain the trade winds, and that's what, how he came across this idea. But he had the Hadley cells going almost to the poles. And then, just about a century later, a German meteorologist, Dover, um, showed the Hadley cells as being more limited in latitude, roughly as we think now with the trade wind regions and then the alternating winds of middle latitudes. So those ideas have been around for some time. Um, but then if one of the ideas of just about almost a century later was that we would get very strong westerly jets if there's just that simple overturning occurred. And also, something has to take those westerly momentum away and move it to higher latitudes. And also in higher latitudes to keep the westerly winds going against friction. <clears throat> Again, an angular momentum is transfer is required. And it's the mid latitude eddies that are thought to be extremely important in this. And that's an idea that has really been very prominent in recent years. Now, if we come on to some simple ideas of the Hadley cell, then one simple perspective is that in the summer hemisphere, the tropics of the southern hemisphere, of the summer hemisphere, there is latent heat release going on in convection, and that warming of the atmosphere in the thermodynamic equation has to be balanced by ascent and adiabatic cooling. So that balances the um, diabatic warming. And then in the winter hemisphere, there is radiative cooling. And then the descent and the adiabatic warming balances that. So in terms of the thermodynamic equation, you get a balance with the heating here and the cooling here. And the ascent here and descent here are then balanced by horizontal cells. And we have the hadley tell cell um, overturning motion. Now, one of the ideas that started in the late 1970s was to think, well, why is the Hadley cell there at all? Why isn't the tropics just full of um, local convection? And so like this, we get almost convection going on everywhere. Now, if that was the case, 
then there would be a certain temperature contrast here because there's more sun here than there is here so at this time of year. So there would be a temperature contrast. And if you think about the, the winds that would be in balance with that temperature contrast, then there's the thermal wind relation, which relates the vertical shear in the wind to the horizontal temperature gradient. And in the tropics where F is small, that means the shear has to be large if there is a temperature gradient. And what one finds is that the winds would be impossibly large in the upper troposphere here if we, if we just had this situation. So the role of the Hadley cell then is seen as to reduce the temperature gradient that would otherwise be there in the tropics and subtropics. So the rising here tends to cool and the descending here tends to warm. So the Hadley cell is seen as being there to uh, reduce the temperature gradients in the tropics. And it extent, seemed to extend, according to the theories of particularly held and how, extends through the latitudes where this reduction is necessary. And in the model of Schneider and held and how, what they were thinking was was the zonally symmetric circulation and the westerly winds, angular momentum would be conserved so you get very strong westerly winds in the subtropics of the winter hemisphere. And then there must be some mixing processes to remove those. But other people have come from the idea of the extra tropics being very important. And if you just do models of baroclinic waves in middle latitudes, like I've done with Adrian Simmons and others have done, then the result of baroclinic instability in middle latitudes is to cool the atmosphere here, warm it here, produce momentum transports, and these drive an, uh, a Hadley cell, a weak Hadley cell in the tropics. So even the mid-latitude eddies tend to drive a, meet, uh, a, a weak Hadley cell in the tropics. And in, in, in the 2000s, a very large role has been seen for the extratropical eddies. Um, baroclinic instability is seen as the limiting to the latitude of the Hadley cell and angular momentum removed from the upper branches of the Hadley cell by these baroclinic waves in middle latitudes, the mid-latitude weather systems. And the extent of the Hadley cell is seen as being determined by the, where it becomes baroclinically unstable and the mid-latitude eddies. So that's a bit of background for you. Um, so now I want to, to give you some ideas of diagnostics that we have done of the Hadley cell in recent years. And these are all using the era interim data from 1981 to 2010, 30 year period. So this shows the same June, July, August Hadley cell with the rising motion. Here's the equator the north, 50 north here. And this is the rising motion and the descending motion in the winter subtropics. Now the blue contours here are of the westerly winds and here's the subtropical jet here in the winter hemisphere. Now the color contours are those of angular momentum. And if angular momentum was conserved in this upper branch of the Hadley cell, you'd see it as being uniform across here. <clears throat> well, it isn't uniform. It actually becomes larger as you come through here, and then it weakens on this side here. It doesn't vary that much in the deep tropics, but it certainly does vary across the whole, whole Hadley cell. So angular momentum is not conserved. It increases on, on the summer part of the branch, and it decreases very strongly in the winter branch. And that decrease is associated then the jet is much weaker than that 130 meters per second because of this decrease. So angular momentum is not actually conserved, but there is interesting behavior there. Now, if we show um, the Hadley cells for the, the two seasons, June, July, August, and December, January, February, these are the opposite solstitial seasons then so this is the one we've looked at, June, July, August, 
and December, January, February, then the rising motion is mostly in the um, southern hemisphere here, and the descending motion is in the northern uh, tropics. And again, angular momentum is not actually conserved in this branch, it does vary. The difference here, um, the fact the rising motion at low levels is largely in the northern hemisphere, is because the intertropical convergence zones stay north of the equator, even in the um, southern hemisphere summer. So that's the picture there. And um, if we look at the transfers of angular momentum, then in the winter, um, in the winter hemisphere, we see the transients, the mid-latitude weather systems, giving a very strong transfer of momentum away from the subtropics here. And again, in the northern hemisphere summer, um, in the northern hemisphere winter, we see again the, the transients, the middle latitude weather systems, transferring angular momentum away from this region. But if we look in the tropics, it isn't dead by any re reason. We do see a lot of transfer of angular momentum. And this is by the steady um, waves, so the longitudinally varying steady flow. And there's a lot of transfer of momentum by them, but a very similar transfer of momentum by the transients as well. And these reverse with the season. So the tropics itself is playing an important role in the angular momentum budget. And it isn't just the mid-latitudes performing the, the transfers of momentum. The tropics do it, and it reverses with the season. So the tropics are playing an important role. Now I want to um, go to some pictures of what the we've seen the steady longitudinally varying flow is important. And I want to give you some pictures of that. So this shows the, in June, July, August, the cross equatorial wind. And it's, I'm showing the V component averaged between 10 south and 5 north. So quite a bit of the Hadley cell, but concentrating on the equatorial region. And if we look at low levels, um, then let's first look at the trade wind regions. We see the flow in the East Pacific here, going into the Northern Hemisphere, and also in the Atlantic. And this is the flow into the intertropical con convergence zone. And um, we see that this is actually by the side of the Andes. Underneath here, I've given the topography on the equator, and this is the Andes. And you can see the flow is just the sort of by the Andes and into the East Pacific here. And again, from Africa into the Atlantic here. But we also see the, the uh, cross equatorial motion near Africa into the summer hemisphere. Um, and then the sort of area you're more used to than the Indian Ocean here. And you see the strong flow by the East African highlands into the northern hemisphere, bringing moisture from the southern hemisphere deep into the northern hemisphere and into India. And we can see that the flow across the equator has a number of different maxima here, which correspond to the topography on the equator. Essentially, the, the maximum flow is in between the topography of the uh, islands here. Now, if we look at a picture to give another picture of the um, zone fairing varying flow. This is the mean flow, the time mean flow. And this shows 950 millibars. And this shows the upper troposphere. But if we look at the lower troposphere first, that's for the first we see the flow across the East Pacific on the, this side of South America and into the intertropical convergence zone here. And again, in the Atlantic, across the equator, and into the intertropical convergence zone, the trade winds on either side blowing into this region. But I want to focus more on the Indian region here, the Indian Ocean region, and the West Pacific. And here we see the strong flow across the equator coming into the um, Indian region here the, and the Bay of Bengal here, and also across the equator 
in the, in the warm pool region here uh, and again into the more East Asian region and the Philippines. So these strong flows here, the Hadley cell flow is by no means a uniform flow. Even in the time average, we see it's very strongly um, located in certain longitudinal regions. Then if we look in the upper troposphere, we can see the return flow. And that was something then, if we look at the mean flow across the equator, we see that corresponding to the Indian Ocean region, we have a return flow. This is the dotted contours showing the flow from the summer hemisphere to the winter hemisphere. And in Africa, we have the return flow. And in the um, intertropical convergence zones in um, the East Pacific and in the Atlantic, we have the return flow. So we have these mean return flows. And so in the next slide then, what we see is where these return flows. I'm showing 150 millibars here and 250 millibars here. And these return um, very in certain regions, and we see the strong return flow here in the Indian Ocean region that I will concentrate on. And you can see the flow. So it's from the northeast across the equator and then turns and become from the northwest as near, somewhere near 15 degrees south. So this is a very interesting flow here. here. Now, this is the low level flow I've shown you already, the mean flow for June, July, August. But this time the color contours, instead of being the strength of the wind, are the outgoing long wave radiation. And the outgoing long wave radiation gives you a very good measure in the tropics of how much deep convection is going on because deep convection has cold cloud tops and so the outgoing long wave radiation is low and that's these values around here around 200 uh, kelvin whereas where there's very little deep convection then one's seeing the lower troposphere and even the land surface and it's very warm so this is a measure of the, the convection that's going on. And you can see the Indian, Bay of Bengal region here, and the Philippines region here. And you can also the, see the intertropical convergence zone heating regions here and here, and the African heating region here. So the, the flow across the equator into this strong Indian Ocean, uh, Indian region heating. That's the mean heating, the mean of outgoing long wave radiation. But if we look at the uh, standard deviation, we can see that these are by no means constant, the convection going on in these regions. There's a lot of the, 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 red, the orangey contour here corresponds to large variability. So the large variability in the regions of large heating. So the heating isn't always there. These values are very significant. So the heating is there sometimes and not at other times. Um, and that's true to a lesser extent in the, in the and to, true to a same sort of extent in the intertropical convergence zone regions and to a lesser extent over Africa. So the heating is, is longitudinally occurs in certain longitudes and it occurs at certain times. It's not there all the time. So it's very different from that zonally time average Hadley cell with the smooth overturning. It happens at certain longitudes and at certain times. Now, these boxes I put here, I'm going to talk more about later on. I'll call this the Indian Ocean box and this one the West Pacific box. But I note that the Indian Ocean box actually just um, includes your university, which is somewhere here, I think. So you're just inside that box here. Now, if we look at what are called Hovmullers uh, of the winds um, and the OLR in a region, well, let's take the OLR from north to 20 north. So this is the region of the deep convection where we've seen 
uh, low LLR. And this shows how transient, how much it changes with time, that uh, those low OLR values. So here we have a very, we have a, a big region with large convection. And here is another one slightly further to the east. But we see all the time, even in these, it's broken up by more synoptic time scales as well. And if we look at the low level winds here, we see the low level winds have variability on synoptic time scales, as well as on the longer time scales that we've seen there. And the upper level return flow, again, we see corresponding to those times of large um, convection we saw in OLR, there's also a large return flow in the upper atmosphere here, the upper troposphere. And we see also the synoptic time scale here as well. So the temporal variability is going along with the convective variability. The winds are varying too. Now I talked about angular momentum and I'm now going to talk much more in terms of vorticity. And I hope that many of you are familiar with vorticity. Vorticity is the spin of the atmosphere. And when we say absolute vorticity, it uh, includes the spin associated with the rotation of the Earth. When it's relative vorticity, it's just the relative spin of the atmosphere. Now, angular momentum is very difficult to deal with when you're thinking locally, because pressure forces change angular momentum. And it's much easier to think of absolute vorticity because the pressure forces don't come in to the absolute vorticity equation. And this equation here tells you that in the zonal average, that's that bracket there, the latitudinal gradient of the angular momentum is actually proportional to the absolute vorticity, the zonally averaged absolute vorticity. So if the angular momentum was constant, the absolute vorticity would be zero. So I'm going to be dealing with vorticity, which we can think of locally, but the zonal average links to the angular momentum. And the change in angular momentum is also related strongly to the poleward vorticity flux, poleward flux of vorticity, V times zeta. The vertical term is in general smaller and also away from the boundary layer, the frictional term is smaller. So the angular, the vorticity and its flux tell you everything we need to know about angular momentum and its change. So if the angular momentum is uniform in the zonal average, then the absolute vorticity should be zero. And also in the upper tr troposphere, in a steady state, um, that's the, the overbar here, then this term is small, this term is small, and this term is small because in, in the time average, this is zero. So in a steady state, we must have the vorticity flux Zoni average, time average must be approximately zero. So there's some very strong constraints on what happens to vorticity. So I'm going to not dwell on this, but this shows again the June, July, August Hadley cell, um, where now the, the color blocks are vorticity. And you can see here, vorticity zero would be um, everywhere just close to the blue or the, the, or the light uh, colored uh, orange color here. And you can see it is nearer zero in the tropics, but it isn't actually zero. So it's close to zero, but not zero. And you can see the vorticity is not conserved, um, but it is does vary through here. And if we took the V times the vorticity, it certainly wouldn't be zero. So it, again, it tells you something else has got to be got to happen. The steady motions and the transient motions have got to be involved. Now that's absolute vorticity. Another quantity I'm going to use is potential vorticity. And don't worry about that if you're not familiar with it. It's like the vorticity, but it is more conserved when moving with the fluid than the vorticity. And I've given you a little cartoon here of what the potential vorticity measures. It measures the spin but it, it also um, measures, it, it takes account of the separation of isentropic surfaces. 
So if the isentropic surfaces move apart, the spin will increase. So if we divide the spin by the separation of those, those isentropic surfaces, that's just about conserved, and that's what the potential vorticity is. So it's very large in high latitudes and in the stratosphere. High latitudes because the spin is large, and the, the stratosphere because the isentropic surfaces are close together. So that's the potential vorticity, but it's very much like the vorticity, but it's very large in the stratosphere. Now these are isentropic surfaces, and this one is 350 Kelvin, and that one's 370 Kelvin, and I'm going to use those quite a lot. You see there, the air will tend to go along those isentropic surfaces if there's no heating or cooling, and also no frictional force in that terms. So um, that isentropic surface here is in the stratosphere here with large um, potential vorticity and much lower it's in the troposphere here with low values. And the same is true of the 370 Kelvin surface. So if we um, look at, say, this 370 Kelvin surface, the potential vorticity, um, just for the 2009 year. So I'm showing you the wider region from 60 west to 180 east. And here you can see the large values of potential vorticity in the um, northern regions here, and then the low values in the, in the tropics going to negative values in the southern hemisphere. But over the um, Asian summer monsoon, we have these low values here. This is, sometimes I call it the great yellow spot, like the uh, red spot of Jupiter. Now, using this color scheme, it's the great yellow spot the Asian summer monsoon, and this associated with it will be anticyclonic circulation. And that anticyclonic circulation tends to bring large values of potential autisticity from the tro uh, extra tropics down into the tropics. And this uh, is an isolated low potential autisticity region here. Now that's what the picture looks like if you look at a seasonal average. But if you look at a particular day, then you see there's loads of transient motions going on. And we can see that the large potential vorticity comes down in streamers here, here. And you can see also that there's places where the northern hemisphere, filaments of northern hemisphere air have come into the southern hemisphere. And here, deep down into the southern hemisphere, interacting with the waves on the southern hemisphere jet. And if I could show you a movie, I didn't think I'd do that because it might be difficult on Zoom, but uh, on uh, Teams, on these links. But uh, you see these streamers coming down from the northern hemisphere into the southern hemisphere. So it shows the monsoon and the, the motions that go up to make the Hadley cell as being very strongly transient. And so now I'm taking that Indian Ocean box I showed you before, and we're looking at uh, the northern hemisphere summer, so 60 to 100 east, 0 to 20 north, and I'm looking at simultaneous things that go along with low OLR. So I'm going to look at the OLR in that box and say, if we look in a 30-year climate, what does the OLR look like when it's low in this box? And this is what it looks like. It looks low in this region, but it looks high elsewhere, in particular, there's very little convection going on over the Philippine regions. And this is the low level flow that goes with this, the regressed low level flow. And you can see the strong flow from deep in the southern hemisphere into the Indian Ocean region here. Oh, sorry, I managed to uh, change that. Right, um, so that's the low level flow that goes with it. And in the upper troposphere, we can see the, the anticyclone around the, um, around the monsoon region, the Indian monsoon region. And then we can see this very strong flow across the equator. So it's, it's much stronger than the, the average in climate. And this flow then goes deep into the southern hemisphere. And we can see that going certainly to, 
to uh, 2025 south. This flow turning here and into the southern hemisphere. And if we, the uh, colors here it show actually the values of relative vorticity. So the relative vorticity is very anticyclonic, corresponding to it almost being conserved on this flow here as it crosses the equator, taking northern hemisphere values of vorticity with it. And you can see it's quite red here. If we take a one year, 2009, this is the OLR that goes with the mean, the re regressed OLR that goes with low OLR in this region. So it looks quite similar to the climate. And so does the low level flow, although it's stronger from the southern hemisphere here. And the northern hemisphere return flow is even stronger than in the climate. And we get this very strong flow and it's coming right as far as the southern hemisphere jet and the waves on that jet. So that's the simultaneous regression. But if you look at the leads and lags, three days before, this is the upper tropospheric picture. The strong flows started across the equator, but three days after, it's continued and it's deep into the southern hemisphere, it's interacting with the southern hemisphere jet. And in fact, coming into um, the region just ahead of a trough in the southern hemisphere jet. So the waves in the southern hemisphere. If we look at the, the West Pacific region, we see a very similar picture. This is what the, when the OLR is large in, the, in that box, then it's large across this whole region here. But you see in the Indian region, the Indian Ocean region, there's very little convection at this time. And the low level flow is crossing the equator into the Indian, Indian region, but not from so deep in the southern hemisphere. And there's a strong flow across in the, in the warm pool region across into this region here. Um, and the return flow is strong in that region now, not so strong in the Indian Ocean region, but strong in this region here. And in the one year, we see the simil similar things here. Um, the flow from the Indian Ocean, Southern Hemisphere into the Indian region, but not so deep. Uh, but there's strong flow across the equator in the warm pool region, the Indian, the maritime continent region, and into this region of convection. And the strong return flow is now here rather than further, further across. So if we take the three days before and three days after again, then the strong flow is like this in, in uh, climate and it extends, um, sorry, in that one year, and then it extends right across to the southern hemisphere jet and interacts with that, bringing its very anticyclonic vorticity with it, intensifying the southern hemisphere jet and the eddies on it. So um, that's the northern hemisphere summer. If we look at the uh, northern, uh, sorry, this, I have one more picture then, which shows two synoptic examples, two days in July of 2009 at the potential vorticity on this 370 Kelvin surface. And these days are only five days apart, but the situation is quite different. This is a situation with strong convection over India and the anticyclone is strong. And here we see the strong flow across the equator with a filament of northern hemisphere potential vortices being, being drawn into the southern hemisphere. Five days later, the convection is stronger over the Philippines region here, and the strong flow across the equator is here, and you can see the low values of potential vorticity coming across the equator in this region here now. So those show the sort of thing that's happening. The Hadley cell is really strong because we get local convection, local return flow across to the southern hemisphere, and um, that's the Northern Hemisphere summer. I'm showing you one example from the Southern Hemisphere summer. And this at a time, this is the anomaly in convection. At this time is in the um, warm, the maritime continent region here across to Australia. 
and to a certain extent in Africa and in the Madagascar region here. And if we look at the potential vorticity on the, it's a 350 Kelvin surface now, we get strong flows across the equator associated with the African convection and an anticyclone here. With the flow towards the equator, actually, this anticyclone creates a strong flow towards the equator to the uh, west of India. And then we have the um, strong flow associated with this across the equator from the uh, maritime continent region across into the uh, to the east of India, um, and then the strong anticyclone here. And you can see the, the trough that is down over India at that time. So again, the convection is localized and the, the Hadley cell um, ingredients are all localized. So they are localized in space and time. So my conceptual model of the Hadley cell, instead of a smooth, it's only time averaged overturning, is much more of a localized. So here we have some localized convection going on in the summer hemisphere associated with synoptic systems, with Madden-Julian oscillations, etc. And that localized convection then leads to an outburst of air across the equator with strong winds across the equator, carrying almost zero um, absolute vorticity from the equatorial region and then turning in the, in the winter hemisphere uh, as, it gets, as it becomes very anticyclonic in that winter hemisphere. And elsewhere, the cross-equatorial winds are small and the absolute vorticity might be even comparable with the Coriolis parameter. So we get these localized in space and time bursts of convection and bursts of flows that give the Hadley cell. So if the active convection occurs at a, well, first uh, at, a, at a proportion of longitudes and a proportion alpha t of the time, alpha lambda of longitudes, well, first, V times zeta is approximately zero, as it must be, because where V is strong, zeta is zero, and elsewhere V is approximately zero. So this constraint that the absolute vorticity flux must be about zero is satisfied in this model. And the mean meridional, meridional flow, mean in time and longitude, would then be alpha lambda alpha t times the value during these bursts. So it would be much smaller than the value in these bursts. And the absolute vorticity would be reduced from f by the same factor. And the subtropical jet would no longer be 130 meters per second. It would be alpha lambda alpha t times that. So the actual jet corresponds to alpha, which is the product of these, being not much more than 0.3. So it says that the actual subtropical jet is consistent with convection happening uh, about a third of the space and time. And elsewhere, there's not too much convection going on. So that's my rather different model of the Hadley cell that I'd like to give you. It's a very con um, idealized model, but I think it is more um, realistic than the the time average, zoni average, slow overturning. Of course, that would correspond to alpha equals one. So the, the usual conceptual model is taking alpha equals one, where it happens everywhere all the time. But I think it's much better to think of it happening now and then and in certain longitudes. So that's my concluding slide then. In a zoni average view, angular momentum transports transports across the equator uh, into the southern hemisphere are important indeed and, um, and are performed by steadily zoni asymmetric and transient motions. So that's the zoni average view, but I think it's much better to look more locally and say the upper branch of the Hadley cell is made up of localized transient bursts associated with tropical convection. So we get bursts of convection at some longitude and some time in the, in the summer hemisphere. And then we get a flow across the equator 
and the filaments of tropical air move into the winter hemisphere, into the winter subtropics. Some are absorbed there and some get as far as the southern hemisphere, the winter hemisphere jet, subtropical jet, and phase in with the, with the waves there. And they enhance those waves and they enhance the momentum transports there. So there is a very strong um, two-way interaction between the, the mid-latitude eddies on the subtropical jet and the, subtrop the tropical convection in the southern hem summer hemisphere. So we get a very strong picture of the Hadley cell interacting with the extra tropics and that the air and the convection and the interesting things are happening locally in time and space. Thank you very much. So now I should come out of this, shouldn't I? And then I can hopefully see you. Um, yes, I can see you again and you yes. can see yes. me, I hope. Thank you very much, Professor Sir Brian Paskins. Uh, I think uh, we have opened a chat box for the questions. Uh, and then, you uh, know, there's only one question uh, there right now that is from me. The question is, uh, are the tropics expanding and moving towards northern polar regions? If this happens, what would be its effect on the Indian summer monsoon? That's my question. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, there has been quite a lot of discussion about the expanding tropics. And when this is done, it is usually taking a zonally average view. And I think we have to think much more locally. And if we are thinking about the Indian monsoon, then we're thinking about the interaction, perhaps more localized in the Indian Ocean sector. And then one says, well, how is the Southern Hemisphere jet behaving? And the Southern Hemisphere jet seems to be um, moving in sympathy with two aspects. One is the ozone hole. So the increase in stratospheric ozone is affecting the Southern Hemisphere jet. And also the, um, the warming, the global warming. And probably at the moment, the behavior in the ozone hole and the weakening, the fact the ozone hole is not um, getting stronger but getting weaker is probably the more important. I cannot answer what influence that will have um, on the Indian monsoon. It may be, um, it may be at a higher order level compared with some of the other impacts of global warming. Um, but I think it is something that we should um, certainly is worth considering in future as part of the mix of how the summer monsoon might change in India in the future. Thank you, Professor Hoskins. We have a question. Yeah. Meeta, we have a question. Yeah. Uh. Uh. Uh, does this phenomena in any way influence uh, the weak temperature gradient approximation over tropics and deep tropics? No, the, um, the weak temperature gradient approximation um, comes in in terms of saying that the tropics cannot support a large temperature gradient. And that's why we can't just have localized convection going on in the tropics, mm -hmm. there is always a link to the vorticity equation and to the winds. So um, the weak temperature gradient approximation is purely in terms of getting a simplified set of equations. And everything I've said is consistent with that simpler set of equations, except that those weak temperature gradient um, approximation would not allow you to get the burst of winds that we see from the upper tropospheric from in the upper troposphere from uh, a region of convection so um, the weak temperature gradient approximation will not allow 
such large bursts of winds. So um, most of what I said is consistent with that, but some of the more synoptic motion is not allowed by that approximation. Uh, thank you, Professor Hoskins. Uh, another question is, uh, uh, with the Hadley cell expanding polewards in both the hemispheres, is baroclinic instability being considered as one of the reasons behind it? Can you throw some light on that? I think the um, baroclinic instability is, well, let's take, let's take it um, a bit, uh, go back a bit. Um, one of the major aspects, there's two major, major aspects to the localized nature of the heating if we look in a, a latitude height section. So one is the fact that um, in the tropics, because of the deep convection, um, any temperature increase in the lower troposphere is amplified at the tropopause level. So all the models give a strong heating uh, of the, um, in the upper troposphere in the tropics. Whereas in the higher latitudes, the, the strong, strongest heating is at the low levels in the Arctic, um, partly associated with the retreating ice there, but also uh, associated with the um, heat transport into this uh, Arctic region. So the higher latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere, are, are, the temperature is expected, is already increasing a lot at low levels and, um, and is expected to more in the future. So there is a, in terms of the thermal wind, um, in the upper troposphere, the heating in the tropics tends to dominate. And that's giving some idea about the expansion of the Hadley cell. The middle latitudes, the baroclinic instability in general is probably going to weaken because the low level temperature contrast is tending to weaken. But then when the waves become deep, they feel a strong increased temperature contrast in the upper troposphere. So it's really, I don't think, I think any simple answers are not well based. We have to think about it quite deeply to see what we expect in future. But I don't think we can see the baroclinic eddies as providing the driver for the tropics changing. I think it may be more the other way around. Okay. Uh, another question is, uh, uh, in the year two, 2020, that is uh, uh, this year, uh, during the southwest monsoon season, there were about two, 12 low pressure systems and majority of them moved west northwestward direction, but none of them intensified into uh, a depression. Uh, uh, and another uh, year before that, we had a similar uh, situation in 2013. Uh, how can we explain this? Yeah, uh, can can you just uh, throw oh, some light? <laughs> you're really trying me on the very difficult nature of the the problems near India, aren't you? And the, um, I, I will not be able to explain it. Um, yeah. those, those systems there, um, the dynamics of those and in terms of the um, growing on the shears around in that region, um, I would have to look much more at the details of the mean flow involved in those seasons. And I'm afraid I can't answer that off the top of my head. I would have to look at it uh, in some depth and then maybe I'm not the expert in those systems either. So one of the things you have to know is that you may be say, giving me a, a, all this acclaim in the uh, introduction, but I have to learn to say, I don't know. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I'm taking a last question uh, from the audience. Uh, is the southward transport of high potential watt city at upper troposphere from the Tibetan anticyclone associated with the enhancements of the low level instability on the synoptic scales? That's a very good question. Um, yeah. I, and the answer is, I'm not sure. I mean, I think there may be a sense in which the transfer of um, um, the trough that one gets on the eastern side of the anticyclone then tends to encourage um, convection in that region. 
And um, I know, for instance, that in, in when there's been some floods in Pakistan and India, that has been associated with troughs on the sub subtropical jet, um, where waves have gone along the subtropical jet and produced an enhanced trough just upstream of the region of either Pakistan or India. And so there, there certainly on occasions, those troughs can induce very strong convection underneath them. It doesn't always happen, but it certainly does happen sometimes. And I remember when I went to India um, a few years ago, you had had very strong floods and I showed an example of one of these situations where the high potential vorticity um, brought way south, indicated this whole situation of the implication of the higher latitudes in your floods when those occur. And there's no doubt um, some of the Indian meteorologists in times gone by thought very much about the impact of high latitudes then that tended to disappear. And I was trying to say, we must take account sometimes of the importance of higher latitudes. And I think Peter Webster is going to be talking about that again with you later on when he talks to you. Yeah. Professor, can I take a couple of questions more? Yes, please do, yes. Yeah. Uh, how does the time average, the symmetric structure of the Hadley cell be over the tropics, except the summer and the winter seasons? Sorry, how much does it? Yeah. How much does it vary? Or No, no. Uh, how does time average, the symmetric structure of the Hadley cell over tropics, except summer and winter uh, sustain, if angular momentum is not conserved? Well, the um, I think that's probably... Um, I think it is it is sustained by the heating that occurs in the summer hemisphere, the summer subtropics. So the summer subtropics actually then sort of drives what is going on. Um, and angular momentum then, I think, is probably not the right concept to use. I think vorticity is very much more the concept to use. And the flows that go from these active convection regions then take some of their, vo their absolute vorticity with them and produce very strong outflows and anticyclonic circulation in the sun in the winter hemisphere. So this sustaining is really from, from the sun, from the convection that occurs and the necessity to equalize the temperature gradients in the tropics. Okay. Uh, how would the potential vorticity distributions at 370 Kelvin and 330 degrees Kelvin would vary between active and weak monsoon years? Ah, so if you take the picture, I, I won't try and show you my talk again, um, but by the way, you're very welcome to have my talk. I will, will send it to you if you wish. Yeah, yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, but if you look at the um, the times I showed, I showed some pictures when the um, outgoing long wave radiation suggested the convection was strong in the Indian region. So in a strong year, you'll see a circulation much more like that. In a weaker year, it will be much more like the other picture I showed when there was a, a, a lack of convection in the Indian region. Okay. Yeah, well, we'll close the uh, question answer session now. And uh, okay. if anybody has just a few more questions, uh, they can directly write to Professor Sir Hoskins uh, via email. Uh, I will provide you the email. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Sir Brian Hoskins, for the enlightening and elucidating lecture on the new perspectives of uh, Hadley, sir. We are very grateful, sir, for your kind cooperation and then consent uh, to be on the list of uh, distinguished speakers for our web series. Uh, with this, I thank you very much. And uh, before I conclude, uh, uh, Dr. C. V. Naidu, uh, the head of the department, would uh, like to propose a formal vote of thanks.
good evening good evening all friends and uh, uh, thank you very much for your active participation uh, uh, professor sir dr brian hoskins is the most uh, uh, prominent researcher in the world in the field of meteorology as a renowned researcher your expertise is of great value to the web series you have presented the most up to date scientific information in a way that will encourage the teaching staff research community and students we are very are fortunate sir today to hear a very informative lecture on the headly cell i should be thankful to you sir for giving us an inspiring lecture i am looking forward for your help in the development of our department of meteorology and oceanography andhra university sir thank you once again sir thank you very much namaskar uh, thank you very much yeah. Yeah. thank, thank you, you very much to all of you uh, yeah. i apologize for for the um, lapse at the beginning but i'm glad yeah. it worked in the yeah. end yeah um, no problem Uh, it was a great pleasure to talk to you all, and uh, I enjoy seeing the faces now of some of those I've talked to. So yeah. I wish you all the very best in your careers. Thank, Thank you. you. We would like to have you in person one day at Andhra University, sir. That would be very nice. I hope yeah. it may. Happen. Thank you, and goodbye yeah. to you all. Yeah, goodbye, Bye. sir. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.